Liam invited me in and I carefully made myself at home on his couch. Can I get you something to drink, he asked. Um, water, please. We had been chatting over the last couple of days on one of those gay chat sites. Liam was tall, lean and handsome. He worked outdoors, so his skin had a glow given to him by the sun. He returned with the water and sat to the right of me on the couch, leaving very little space between us. Any problem finding a place, he asked. Um, no, it, it was pretty easy. He placed his hand on my knee. My leg vibrated with excitement. Well, aren't you cute, he said. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you nervous, he asked. You seem nervous. No, I I'm fine. His hand moved to my inner thigh. Why don't we relax in the bedroom? <laughs> I was in my late 20s and had very little relationship experience. Liam was 15 years my senior. I would see him nearly daily over the next few months. On my free evenings, we often cooked elaborate dinners, always served with wine. It wasn't unusual to have friends over for these meals, but looking back, they were always his friends, never mine. There were weekend trips to the desert, Sunday drives, and trips to the farmer's market. Liam also made me appreciate the beauty in things. One day, looking at a summer sunset, he asked, what do you think about that? It's nice, I said. That's all you can say, he asked? Take a moment, take it in, tell me how, you make, how it makes you feel. I didn't come from a particularly expressive family. I didn't use words like beautiful to describe a sunset at the time, but Liam did have a way of making me see and express the beauty in things, even if he had to pull it out of me. He was what this little gay boy thought of all his life. I thought, this just might be my future husband. Though I was too caught up to see the manipulation, of course. The charming side of him camouflaged the manipulation. It was about six months in, we were lying in bed one night watching television. I assumed it was the cheating boyfriend on a silly sitcom we were watching that prompted the question, would you leave me if you found out I slept with someone else, Liam asked. I immediately wondered if this in fact was a rhetorical question. But before I could formulate a thought or an answer on the subject, he continued, I mean, I wouldn't leave you if you made a mistake, you know, a one-time occurrence. I thought for a moment and replied, I suppose I could forgive a mistake. Did one of us make a mistake? <laughs> of course not, he said. It was just a question. I just hope we could survive something as minor as that. I can only smile and wrap myself in his arms and hope neither one of us made a mistake. <laughs> Believe me when I tell you mistakes were made. I wish I can say after two or three mistakes I was out the door, but the next few years will be a roller coaster ride of mistakes. My only saving grace was we never lived together and it was before the popularity of social media so there weren't constant changes in relationship status or online bickering between us. A year in, I realized Liam had a sex addiction. Okay, I really don't know that for sure, but <laughs> if he took some online tests for the addiction, I'm sure they would recommend that he seek treatment. <laughs> so He was self-employed, which provided him with plenty of idle time. I was new to the career field of law enforcement, so I often worked nights and weekends giving him the freedom he secretly desired. At first, it was just the occasional text message I would catch a glimpse of on his phone. Then there were the condom wrappers he was too lazy to throw away. But like an idiot, I stood by my man because of course he promised it would be the last time. It was always the last time. It was a mistake. What the fuck is this? I said, staring at a text message on his phone, asking if he was free to fuck today. <laughs> Liam came out of the bathroom with a towel wrapped around his waist. What are you talking about? This asshole, I said while tossing the phone. By now, asshole was my cute little pet name for him. <laughs> he looked at the phone. I don't even know who this is. Probably just an old fuck buddy. You are such a fucking liar. I'm sure it's just someone I haven't talked to in a while who doesn't know I'm in a relationship now, he said. Is that what we call this? I said. I left for work in a rage, as I often did. Left a fume all day while more than likely he was getting off. Being with him didn't feel good, but being away felt worse. I was living in purgatory. I spent my time at work wondering what or whom he was doing. I guess to some degree, I had an addiction too. There were times I tried to walk away, but the pain of being away from him and alone felt greater than the portrayals, so I dealt with them. Our love was sick, twisted, and diseased, but the little gay boy inside of me believed it was better than nothing. Soon, I landed an assignment at work as a school resource officer for my department. I had regular day shift hours with weekends off. We had dinner together nightly. 
there were weekend trips again. The normalcy of my hours temporarily mended the relationship. But what that really meant was it gave Liam less time to get into trouble. At work, I visited schools talking to school-aged children about the dangers of drugs and alcohol while battling my own addiction for Liam. I worked with one other officer, and we had very little oversight. We pretty much managed ourselves. One particular afternoon, I was finishing up a class, and I decided I would surprise Liam for lunch. Actually, I just wanted to surprise Liam, keep him on his toes. I wish I could say it was instinct, but the fact of the matter was, if I was away, Liam would probably play. As I drove across town, I knew I was going to walk in on some shit and just had to decide whether or not I was ready to step in it. The closer I got to the house, the faster my heart raced. I cruised down the street. I parked an unmarked Crown Victoria in front of the house and stepped out of the car. <laughs> Liam's truck was in the driveway. I walked to the front door, fully aware of the pounding in my chest. I let myself in with a set of keys that I had given him back for the last time, more times than I could count. The living area was deserted. Other than the AC window unit going at full blast, the house was quiet. I was hit with a blanket of coolness, yet I still felt hot. I made way, my way down the hallway as my boots echoed off the hardwood floors, more than likely warning him of my presence. I could hear whispers. I reached the bedroom door and didn't hesitate to fling it open. Fuck, Liam said. Two naked bodies, one being Liam, jumped out of the bed before I could even tell what exact sexual act they were engaged in. They scattered to the far side of the bedroom as I stood by the only exit to the door. With his hands outstretched towards me as if he was trying to stop traffic, Liam said, I am sorry, I am so sorry. Just shut up, I shouted. <laughs> I began to pace back and forth in length of the bed while some poor man's version of myself stood next to Liam, covering his junk and visibly shaking. We were merely the same age, complexion, and size, but I was a hell of a lot cuter. Liam had a type, and that was all I was to him, a type. He was cheating on me with a knockoff. <laughs> I realized at that moment I contained the power in this situation. It was a great power I needed to use responsibly, but what's the joy in that? <laughs> as much pain as I felt in that moment, a tiny voice said, we might as well have some fun. <laughs> I took my right hand and placed it on my holster and began to pace faster, and I began an angry rant <laughs> like an out-of-control homeless man. <laughs> Hell, ride or die. We should just end it right now. We all go out in a blaze of glory. The stranger dropped to his knees as if he was about to pray. Liam urged me to calm down and continue to throw out empty apologies. By this time, I was raising my other hand, forming an imaginary gun like a child would, and I proceeded to shoot my boyfriend and his trick. Bang, bang. I then fled the scene. Once behind the wheel of the Crown Victoria, I thought, did I really just shoot them with an imaginary gun? Yeah. But that was all I could think to do. I knew I had put the fear of death into them, and frankly, the third party drawn into that drama probably didn't deserve that. He was nothing more than a scapegoat. The real problem was my inability to leave Liam. I knew more than likely they would forget about their near-death experience in a day or two, but the hurt and betrayal I carried would last months and still occasionally rear his ugly head as baggage in future relationships. I vowed never to lose myself like that again. I promised myself I would walk away before I committed another homicide. Ladies and gentlemen, that's Derek Woodford.